let's get started then. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Ellis, um, a undergraduate and PhD, uh, master's and PhD um, student at MIT, working with Josh Tenenbaum and um, Armando Solar Lizama. Um, he's going to be uh, talking about his work in artificial intelligence, uh, program synthesis, and cognitive science. And I'm very excited to hear the talk. Take it away. Thank you, Dan, for that introduction. I'm very really excited to be at UW. Uh, so human intelligence allows us to solve really an endless range of problems, from cooking to calculus to graphic design. And what I think is really remarkable is that in spite of this diversity, we need really relatively modest amounts of experience to acquire any one new skill. Now, some things like getting really good at checkers might take a little while, but other things like learning to new, use some new mechanical device, such as the pasta maker on this slide, we can pick up after just a few minutes of experience. I see a key long-term goal of AI as being to build machines which can similarly master this endless range of problems, while at the same time not needing enormous amounts of experience to master any one new individual skill. So, what kind of machine could learn all of this? Well, each generation of AI has made important progress toward answering some version of that question. The first waves were dominated by what's sometimes called symbolic approaches to AI. And these approaches really gave us um, a lot of modern computer science. They gave us computer algebra systems and they gave us machines that could, for example, beat chess grandmasters. But at the same time, these systems tended to be rather brittle and did not um, handle the uncertainty and messiness of the real world and struggle to really adapt and flexibly grow with experience. Many of these limitations are addressed by probabilistic or statistical approaches to AI, which really gave us the first scalable and practical approaches to machine learning. They gave us the first commercially viable speech recognition systems. They're used by the UN to monitor nuclear tests. And they give us really much of Google up till a decade ago. Deep learning or neural network approaches to AI have been enormously popular over the past uh, five to 10 years for really good reason. Because in some sense, they actually seem to be meeting the challenge that I posed earlier. Different kinds of neural networks can learn to recognize objects and images or generate convincing English prose or play challenging games at superhuman levels. So in some sense, they actually are making progress on this. In another sense though, what and how they learn is rather different from human learning. In particular, they tend to generalize more weakly from experience than a human learner would, and so suffer from a very dramatic thirst for data. And the kind of knowledge that they acquire from that data is usually not formatted in a way that humans can understand or explain or build on. During this talk, I'll be discussing an approach to AI called program induction. And the idea is that we build machines that represent knowledge as code, as programs, and which learn by adding to that body of knowledge by synthesizing programs. You shouldn't see program induction as being in opposition to any of um, these AI traditions. Instead, as I'll show my work, it really combines elements of all three of them and brings some new things to the table. So why would you want to do this? Why would you want to represent knowledge as code and learn but through program synthesis? So there's a few reasons why. One is that programs tend to generalize very strongly beyond the data on which they are based. Intuitively, they tend to extrapolate rather than interpolate. And this leads to um, very sample efficient learning. Programs also tend to be pretty interpretable. Not all code is interpretable, a theme which I'll return to later in the talk, but usually they're pretty human understandable. To get an, an intuition for this, contrast a 3D CAD representation of an electric drill, like shown on the top, with the analogous point cloud or mesh representation shown on the bottom. The CAD program is much easier to understand and extend than the analogous uh, mesh representation. But really the most celebrated feature of programs is their Turing completeness. The fact that every computable function is representable as some kind of program. And that means that at least in principle, in theory, they could actually capture the full span of problems that are solvable by intelligence. So this idea is like fairly simple and it has these easy to understand intuitive appealing properties, which means that surely someone must have tried this before. 
And in fact, this is in some sense, one of the oldest ideas within AI. And in some form, it traces back to the original Dartmouth workshop that founded the field. And with each generation of AI researchers, this idea has been rediscovered in different forms. So for example, the inductive logic programming community or the genetic programming community are other examples of this idea. Now, there have been some successes. For example, genetic programming is successful within industry, at least. But it's really fair to say that this idea has never really taken off in the same way that graphical models or neural networks have taken off. And there's a number, there's a number of reasons why it hasn't really taken off like other approaches within AI. But I think the main reason is that combinatorial search is hard. In order to induce programs, you need to search the space of all programs, but that space is infinite and sharply discontinuous. And this poses challenges for search and therefore challenges for learning. Much of what I'll be discussing in this talk are new algorithms for addressing this challenge of combinatorial search, which use machine learning methods, and which I hope will allow program induction to scale and become more broadly applicable for artificial intelligence. So in light of the fact that all these smart people have worked on this problem, why do I think that we should be revisiting it and trying again? So one reason is that we have better machine learning toolkits. And it's not just that we have deeper neural networks and more sophisticated graphical models. It's that, as I'll show in this talk, we have new ways of combining all of these toolkits and bringing them to bear on this core problem of combinatorial search, which I hope will allow this method to scale. The other reason is because in parallel, the program synthesis community has been developing new algorithms for searching the space of programs. Largely, they have not been doing this for the purpose of solving AI problems, but we can import a lot of their techniques and repurpose them for AI problems. Last, when that Dartmouth workshop was kicking off, we were just getting out of the vacuum tube era, whereas now we live in the era of massively parallel compute. And much of what has accelerated machine learning, particularly deep learning, in the past few years has been algorithms which can effectively soak up these vast compute resources. During this talk, I'll be discussing new algorithms which can effectively metabolize these vast compute resources at our disposal, and which I hope will allow program induction to scale in much the same way that other machine learning methods have scaled with, in with increasing compute. Another advantage that we have today over that Dartmouth workshop is that we have a kind of on-ramp of practical stepping stones, tractable problems, which are instances of program induction, which we can push and which actually have an immediate payoff. Problems like semantic parsing or programming by examples, programming by example technologies now ship in Excel, or computer-aided programming, the problem of automating software engineering, or inverse procedural modeling, the problem of inferring um, geometric models from perceptual data. All of these are different kinds of program induction, and progress on program induction in the general case can translate toward progress on all of these problems. So I've structured this talk around three different themes with the goal of showing how program action can contribute to machine intelligence. The first theme is how gen uh, synthesizing generative graphics programs can contribute to high level scene understanding, focusing on case studies in two dimensional hand drawings and three dimensional objects. The second theme is how synthesizing human understandable causal models uh, through program synthesis can allow us to discover structure in data. And the last theme where I'll be spending most of my time is on new algorithms for learning to synthesize programs. I'll be spending most of my time here because these algorithms, I believe, are key to really unlocking the broad applicability of program induction. And I'll be showing applications to a range of AI domains, which uh, include things like discovering the forms of equations or writing code or drawing pictures. So I'm going to start out with program induction and visual perception. And I'm going to start out by just noting that visual perception is much more than knowing what is where. Vision is also about having a high level coherent global scene understanding that cuts across the geometry of the entire image. So as an example of this, here is a picture of an aqueduct and I've occluded part of it. And I want you to imagine using your high level visual intelligence, what should go in that occluded region. So just hold that picture in your mind, what you think should go there, and then contrast it with what you actually see. 
In addition to extrapolating our visual percepts, we can also impute missing objects. So here's a picture from a machine learning blog post. And part of the picture was alighted with these ellipses. Can you use your visual intelligence to figure out what should go in the ellipses? And can you imagine a much bigger version of this object? And if we could actually make a machine which could do all these tasks, it wouldn't just be useful for these little visual perception demos. It would actually be very practical. We could use this to automate graphic design, to assist the computer-aided design of mechanical parts. Um, there's many real-world applications of a technology which could do all of that. So we have built a system which instantiates some of these ideas. And I'm going to show you now what it does for two-dimensional hand drawings. So given an image like the one on the left, it infers a high-level program written in a LaTeX-like language. So um, like this program here is nested for loops, and that captures this repetitive structure in the input drawing. Just like how you visually extrapolated that aqueduct, we can automatically extrapolate these hand drawings just by increasing loop bounds. So if you just increase the loop bound here and then run the program, what you get is a kind of automatically generated extrapolation of the input drawing. We can do this for a range of drawings. So for each of the hand drawings on the top, ask yourself, what would it mean to just kind of make it bigger, like extend its visual patterns, and then contrast that with the um, machine generated output on the bottom. So now I'm going to explain how the system works at a high level. So the way to think of this is there's some image we observe, and that's generated from some program that we don't get to observe. So it's uh, what's called latent. Um, this program proceeds not by immediately generating pixels, but by issuing a sequence of drawing commands. And these drawing commands are what are actually rendered to the canvas. Because we have a two-stage generative model, that motivates a two-stage inference pipeline. And that's exactly what we do. So in the first stage, a convolutional neural network proposes a set of drawing commands, which explain the target image, but which lacks any kind of coherent high-level program structure. In the second phase, we use program synthesis to infer a high-level graphics routine, which is consistent with those drawing commands. Because these program synthesis techniques that we're using here do a kind of uh, smart exhaustive search, they tend to, in the worst case, scale exponentially. And so we use learning to guide the um, program search in order to uh, quickly home in on the region of the search space that are likely to contain um, uh, programs consistent with the data. Once we have this program, we can extrapolate it, as I've shown you earlier, or we can correct errors, as I'm going to show you next. So here's error correction. Uh, here's a picture of a binary search tree-like thing. And if you just pass it to the first stage of the pipeline, to the neural network, it actually predicts this. So it hallucinates an extra line and connects two lines that shouldn't be connected. So it made a mistake. But if you were to imagine writing code for this uh, drawing here that it produced, that code would be really long and unwieldy because it's not picking up on the high level structure of the binary search tree. Um, so it made this mistake here, and that mistake means it can't write a single for loop that explains everything. But if you were to add an inductive bias or a prior which preferred more naturally structured or shorter programs, then what you would get is a bias toward a uh, interpretation of the image which captured this global structure. So if you add in a top-down bias um, toward programs that are shorter, what you get is a correct recovery of the underlying image structure, which corrects that mistake. So concretely, what we're doing is a kind of interaction between uh, bottom-up perception and top-down reasoning from the program. You can think of this as a hierarchical Bayesian model, where we have a collection of images for which we're going to infer a program for each of them. And at the highest level, there is a prior over programs, which we are going to estimate jointly with inferring the program for each individual image. And when you do this hierarchical inference, you can also correct more complicated mistakes, such as the one I'm showing here. So in the bottom, you can see the lines are misaligned. And on the right, you can see that an arrowhead is missing. But if you prefer a more naturally structured program, you get a bias which corrects these mistakes. So we did this for 2D. And you might be thinking, could you do something analogous for three-dimensional objects? And we have a system which can do a version of that. In particular, it takes input a voxel field and then infers a constructive solid geometry routine 
um, which you could then execute and, for example, render out of different views. The challenge here, though, is that the search space is actually much larger. In particular, in our graphics language, we have approximately 1.3 million different lines of code. And for some of the objects we want to explain, you might need to write something like 20 lines of code. So that gives a search space well in excess of the number of atoms in the universe. So this gets at this core issue of combinatorial search I was alluding to earlier. So how are we going to tame this combinatorial explosion? So what we did is we engineered a new program synthesis algorithm, which operates in a way which is kind of similar to AlphaGo. So it's a combination of learning and tree search. The way it works is as follows. Uh, imagine that you had some object to explain, like the chair that I'm showing here. So you might start out with the empty program, which I've uh, written as the empty set. A neural network, which I'm calling a policy, proposes new lines of code, which are then rendered. So these are the actual samples from the policy on this shape. And you can see that the top two samples look like they're mistakes, like it's a cylinder that's sideways. But the bottom one looks like the base of the chair. So another neural network called a value function steps in and upweights the proposals from the policy that it deems to be more promising. So it sort of expands parts of the search tree which um, look like they're on the right track. And we interleave this policy and value function in an explicit symbolic tree search, and this allows us to scale toward um, longer programs. So we can do this for a range of shapes, but what I think is more interesting is that we can do this for a very different kind of domain. So in particular, we can do this for uh, problems that edit text in the kind of flash fill style. And when you do this for text editing, what we found is that you actually outperform the state of the art in neural uh, program synthesis, namely robust fill. So there's a couple things that you should take away from this section. One is that the inductive bias of a programming language, simply by having higher order constructs like loops and variable bindings, can give you very strong generalization properties, even from a single image. The second thing to take away from this is that I think we should really be combining the best of different techniques. We should be using neural nets for perception, but also for pattern recognition to help guide combinatorial searches. Uh, symbolic methods are very powerful for abstraction and reasoning, and Bayesian methods offer the right kind of probabilistic glue for principled handling of uncertainty and for learning to learn. So now I'm going to talk about program induction and synthesizing human understandable models. Um, and there's really been a lot of work on automatically coming up with um, theories or models from experimental data. So you might know this work on coming up with physics laws from experimental data or this work on gene interaction networks. And in works like these, they often explicitly frame what they're doing as a kind of program synthesis. They're trying to find the program that best explains the data. Now, it is the case that human scientists look at individual data sets and come up with the you know, best equations for that data set, but that's not all that scientists do. They do something much more interesting, which is that they look at lots of data sets and they say, what is the best explanation for each data set individually, but also at the higher level, what are the kind of meta principles that cut across all of the data sets? So for example, in physics, one of these meta principles is the principle of least action. In the language sciences, the principles that cut across different languages are collectively known as universal grammar. I think that the language sciences or linguistics are really one of the best places to study science at this two levels of action, both the action at individual data sets, but also at the higher level across different data sets. So here's why I think that linguistics is a good test bed. One is that there's a tremendous diversity of languages, and this gives a really rich and varied test bed for benchmarking different algorithms. Also, linguists very explicitly operate at the level of individual languages and also at the higher level of universal grammar. Linguists and children can learn these kinds of language patterns from relatively modest amounts of experience. So that means if you have the right universal grammar, the right inductive bias, problems like these are actually tractable. So I wanna give a concrete example of what I mean when I say these language learning problems. Um, and it involves a live demo. Uh, so we're gonna try it over Zoom and I, I think it'll still work. So here's some data from Mandarin. Um, the word for slow in one inflection is man and in a different inflection is man manda. The word for small is xiao and in a different inflection it is xiao xiao da. If I tell you that the word for fast is kuai, I want you to think to yourself, 
what is it in the other inflection? So probably you can figure this out. It's just quite quite a. And if you're a linguist, you would say, oh, you just take the stem, add it to itself, and add da. That's an easy example, and I'm going to give you another easy example. So here's some data from Serbo-Croatian. Um, in the masculine form, the word for rich is bogat. In feminine, it's bogata. Blog becomes blaga. If I ask you what zelen becomes, you can probably figure out that it's going to be um, zelena. So that was pretty easy, and I'm going to mix it up by giving you the feminine form. So if I tell you the feminine form of a word is yasna and ask you for the masculine form, um, I want you to hold in your head what you think that would be and then compare it with this. So you probably thought it was yasin, which is almost correct, uh, but it's actually yasan. And the reason is because in Serbo-Croatian, there's a process called a penthesis, which inserts an a ah in between word final consonants. And if you are a linguist, what you would do is you would describe that process by writing down the program uh, shown at the bottom, which just says, um, insert an ah in between two consonants at the end of a word. So these are some very easy problems. Um, and if you take a linguistics class, you'll see that there's entire textbooks just chock full of these inductive reasoning riddles. Uh, I've been working with a team of linguists at MIT and McGill to compile a data set of uh, these language learning problems. And our system can solve most of the problems in these textbooks. And now that I've shown you the easiest problems that we can do, I want to show you the hardest ones so you can get a sense of the range. So here's 100 words from a language that is related to Turkish. Um, I'm going to zoom in on just a few words from this problem. So here is um, just six words in singular and plural form. The word for bed is aron in singular. If you've got two beds, it's oronor. The word for mare is bie. If you have two mares, it's bie lair. One cabinet is iskap, and two cabinets is iskap tar. So I've underlined the plural suffix here to demonstrate that they're all different. And you should think that this data is super weird. This looks very strange. It's kind of like a puzzle. And it turns out that there is a way of solving this puzzle figuring out what's going on in this language. And we have an algorithm which combines constraint-based program synthesis with test-driven program synthesis to solve prog problems such as these. So if you give our algorithm this data from this language, it decides that the plural suffix is actually lar, which you should also think is really weird, because lar is none of these suffixes. So what's going on here? So what's actually going on here is that there's a system of rules, which I've shown here, written out in the notation that linguists write them out. Now, if you're not a linguist, then these rules might look uh, a little bit hard to interpret, but all of them can be described uh, using a little bit of English text. So they all just sort of move around in the mouth where different things are pronounced. Um, each of these rules is a function that maps um, strings of symbols to strings of symbols. And I'm going to now illustrate how these rules operate to explain the data. So in order to do that, you also have to add in some stems, like a kind of lexicon or an inventory of uh, uh, basic forms. And so if you combine the stems the system uh, infers with the grammar, uh, this is what happens. So if you want to predict the pronunciation of a word like beds in this language, you start out with the stem, which is aron, and you concatenate the suffix for the plural, which is lar. And then each of these rules fires in sequence. So here's rule one operating and so on, and iteratively transforms this string in order to predict its final pronunciation, which is oronor. So what I've shown here in black is the execution trace or derivation of the data. Um, so we've evaluated the system on a range of different languages um, shown here. Uh, so these are 70 different problems from 58 different languages. Um, and for each of them, we can compare different approaches. So here on the x-axis, I'm showing how much of the problem we can solve. And in different colors, I'm plotting different algorithms. So in yellow is a grammar induction algorithm, which was proposed last year um, for problems such as these. And in the darker shades, I'm showing um, our program synthesis-based algorithm. The main difference between these darker shades is the kind of inductive bias, which is given to the learner. 
So what you can see from this is that this inductive bias, this universal grammar clearly matters, like it makes a difference. But you also might be thinking like, could we learn the inductive bias much as we did for hand drawings? So it turns out that the answer to that question is sort of. You need to get some of the basics of the computational substrate correct. You need the right kind of programming language operators. But once you have those operators, you can then learn a probability distribution over the kinds of rules that tend to occur. So the kinds of typological tendencies you see across languages. And this is actually useful for solving problems. So what's really going on is we're doing hierarchical Bayesian inference. We're doing grammar induction over each problem and then grammar induction over the grammars that we find to induce a kind of meta grammar. And doing this thing here is actually essential for solving the hardest problems in the textbook. So for example, we don't solve that complicated Turkish problem unless we do this hierarchical inference over multiple languages. So there's a couple things you should take away from this. One is that higher level knowledge really matters. This universal grammar actually played a key role in allowing the system to learn from a small amount of data. But some of this higher level knowledge you can actually learn and you don't really need a ton of data to learn it. We had 70 different problems and we trained on 40 and tested on 30 and it was this universal grammar was still useful for those 30 problems. So in the system that I described earlier and in this system learning played a role but it's also fair to say that these were specialized systems for graphics and for linguistics. Now I want to ask, like, can we pop up a level and come up with a more generic algorithm which can learn to synthesize programs for many different classes of problems? So I think this is a kind of learning to learn because you're learning to learn programs. And I, I think of the setup as being like this. You want to acquire some domain expertise or some domain knowledge in order to induce programs. And really that domain knowledge comes in two different flavors. So one aspect of domain knowledge is having the right programming language. A, uh, what in old school AI terms is called declarative knowledge. I'm going to think of this as being a library or a domain specific language. It's gonna be the operators in the programming language. The second thing you need to learn is an inference strategy or a synthesis algorithm. In old school AI terms, this is like procedural knowledge. So to make things concrete, imagine that we needed to learn how to um, look at a graph of a function and then write some code that would fit the points on that graph. So if you look at this function here, uh, you probably remember from high school algebra that the function goes like this, that it is a cubic function. Uh, so in order to do that, you needed the explicit knowledge of cubic functions. So you need a concept like cubic curve and polynomial but also you need some implicit procedural skill that allows you to eyeball the graph and single out that concept as being relevant for this problem. So we have an algorithm which jointly acquires both this library of code and also comes up with this inference strategy. And I'm gonna illustrate what that algorithm does on a classic program synthesis domain. So I'm gonna focus on programs right now which manipulate lists of numbers. So imagine that you needed to sort a list of numbers and you're given some input output examples like those shown on the right. And on the left, you, I'm showing the initial uh, library of primitives given to the system. So we wanna go um, from map and fold and if and cons and car to sorting a list of numbers. So somehow we gotta get all the way from the left to the right. And that's a pretty big gap because these initial set of primitives is not really uh, powerful enough to concisely explain a sorting algorithm. So what our algorithm does is it takes as input not just one problem, but a collection of problems, and it tries to solve problems and then add new functions to its set of primitives and go back and forth between adding new primitives and solving more problems. So if you run this algorithm on a corpus of programming problems like this, what it does is it very quickly um, defines a function called filter, which is a higher order function that takes a predicate and a list and removes all the elements that don't satisfy that predicate. And it adds that to its library. I'm calling that concept four because it was the fourth concept that it added to its library. Now that's getting closer in the direction of sorting, but we still have a ways to go. So if you look deeper into its library of concepts, what you see 
is that the 13th concept that it discovered um, calculates the maximum element of a list. And as you can see, uh, this 13th concept calls out to filter uh, to concept four. So this is getting closer to sorting. Now, if you look into the sort of final layer of this system's uh, network of functions, what you see is that um, it learned a function that calculates the nth largest element of a list. And it does so by calling out to the, this maximum function and this filter function. And now we're almost all the way to sorting. So now we can write a sorting algorithm, which is very concise. Um, it just calls out to concept 15. And if you were to read it in English, it would say something like, get the nth largest element as n goes from one to two to three and so on. So this is uh, fairly human understandable. Uh, like if you understand what concept 15 does, you can understand what this code does. It's transparent and easy to see how it's sorting. Now in principle, you don't need all of these learned functions. You could have just sorted a list of numbers using the initial set of primitives. And if you were to rewrite the, this sorting algorithm in terms of those primitives, um, this is what you would get. So this program here is long and cryptic and would take far longer than the age of the universe to actually find. Like it's essentially out of reach of any reasonably bounded search. Um, so in particular, um, with this learned library, the algorithm was able to find this sorting algorithm in under 10 minutes. But if you were to not do this library learning and just do brute force search, it would take on the order of 10 to the 73 power years just to solve this problem. So now I'm going to explain how the algorithm works that um, solved this sorting example. So this algorithm is called Dream Coder. And the reason why it has this name is because it is an instance of what is in the machine learning community called a quote unquote wake sleep algorithm. If you're familiar with the Helmholtz machine, uh, that's another example of a wake sleep algorithm. So it has what is called a wake phase where it solves problems by writing programs. And then crucially different from classic wake sleep algorithms, we have a pair of interleaved sleep phases. So the first sleep phase called abstraction sleep builds new abstractions in the library. So it grows out that network I was diagramming earlier. And the second sleep phase, what I'm calling dream sleep, trains a uh, neural network, which I'm gonna call a recognition model to help search for programs during waking. And it's this algorithm that we were able to apply to uh, many different kinds of domains. So at a high level, you can think of this as a hierarchical Bayesian inference problem where you have a bunch of tasks to solve and we want to write code or we want to write a program solving each of them while at the same time inferring a library which is going to capture regularities that cut across different programs. One twist we're going to add to this picture here is we're going to train a neural network which is going to help amortize the cost of search. So we're going to pay a cost for training the neural network, but in exchange, we're going to get faster program synthesis times. So from a kind of Bayes eye view, what we've done is we've taken this generative model and we've added a neural network that guides inference. Um, there's a few other differences, like we're going to use some good ideas from program synthesis and programming languages but at a high level, um, like this is one of the main differences. So if you look at this model, there's three things that we don't know. There's the library, there's the programs, and there's the neural network. And that motivates a three phase uh, iterative learning procedure. And that's exactly what we do. So in what I'm gonna call the wait phase, um, we hold the library fixed and the neural network fixed and we infer programs. So we take a task, like these input-output examples, and pass it to the neural network, the recognition model, which biases a search over the space of programs. And we search until we either solve the task or we reach a timeout. During the dream phase of sleep, we train the neural recognition model on pairs of programs and tasks. And now we can get pairs of programs and tasks in two different ways. One thing we can do is we can just take the programs we found during waking and tell the neural network, when you see this task that you solved during waking, predict this program. So it's kind of like replaying the problems that you solved earlier. But a more interesting source of data is to uh, sample or fantasize 
uh, programs from the learned library. So you can, take a, you can take your library, build a random program, and then just run it to see what it did, and then that's new training data. Now, these days, a lot of people are training neural networks in simulation, and you can think of this as being an instance of that idea, except that here the simulator is a library. It's a way of stochastically simulating new programs, and it's learned over time. During the abstraction phase of sleep, we take the programs found during waking, and then we refactor them in order to compress out uh, new reusable abstractions. So I want to zoom in on this abstraction phase of sleep because it illustrates how principles from programming languages can be useful to us as AI researchers. So in order to start out with talking about this abstraction phase, uh, I want to write down a very simple program which just adds five to itself. So it calculates five plus five. Uh, in Python, you would write it like this. In Lisp, you would write it like this. And as a syntax tree, you would write it like this. Now, I want to zoom in on this syntax tree and think about different ways of rewriting this program with an eye toward eventually refactoring it to ex expose some new component that we could add to our library. So one way of rewriting it is to define a new function, which calculates 5 plus x and set x equal to 5. Another thing we can do is we can have a function which calculates x plus 5 um, and set x equal to 5. Or we could say that it's x plus x with x equal to 5. Or we could even say it's 5 plus 5 with x equal to 5. That's also a valid refactoring. And all of these are semantically equivalent to the original program, which I'm going to notate with this orange dashed arrow. So you should uh, think of this as being similar to um, equivalence graphs, um, which is an idea in programming languages, which is really being developed um, in large part here at UW. Um, so if you look at these four ways of refactoring the original program, they all look kind of the same. They all vary just in whether these leaf nodes are a 5 or an x. And you can collapse together all of these refactorings into a new uh, data structure that I've shown here. Um, so in this new data structure, I have a node called any, which you can think of as being a kind of non-deterministic choice. It means you can choose any of my children, and you will still respect the semantic equivalences indicated by these orange dashed lines. So you, you can see analogous ideas in the version space literature, particularly version spaces applied to programming languages which were um, also really pioneered here at UW. So there's a number of other ways you could refactor this program. Um, for example, instead of abstracting out um, five, you could abstract out the plus sign. You could also dive into the syntax tree and um, refactor just the number five. And all of these are valid refactorings. So this data structure represents a uh, very large set of refactorings. In fact, it's exponentially large as a function of the size of the data structure. And you can see that very easily. In particular, for each of these any nodes, we have two different ways that we could um, uh, choose the leaves. And if you percolate those random choices up through the syntax tree, what you see is this repeated doubling action. You get this exponential growth in the number of refactorings. So now I'm going to show how this data structure is actually useful for discovering new library components. So imagine we have two functions, uh, or two expressions, uh, 5 plus 5 and 4 plus 4. And I've shown here a subset of the data structure constructed in each case. I'm going to zoom in on two subtrees in particular and label them A and B. And A and B look almost the same. Now, A and B are really encoding a set of possible programs. These non-deterministic choice operators really give you a set of possible alternatives. And we can efficiently intersect those sets. And if you look at the intersection, you get this expression. And if you were to rewrite it in Lisp, it would look like this, which just says, um, add x to itself. And if I were to give a name to it, I would just call it double. It doubles numbers. And you can imagine that if you had many such expressions, like 5 plus 5 and 4 plus 4 and 3 plus 3, it would kind of pay off to add double to your library. And it's that compression-based paying off that motivates this uh, particular refactoring. Now, this seems like a lot of work just to learn how to double numbers. And I didn't go to this effort to uh, just learn how to double. 
Um, so now I'm going to illustrate a more interesting case of this refactoring algorithm. So imagine that you needed to solve two tasks. One is on the right, given a list of numbers, subtract one from each element. And on the left, I've shown a problem which is given a list of numbers, double each element. Now, if you had a programming language that had the map function, um, which takes a list and a function and applies the same thing to, to each element, uh, this would be an easy problem to solve. But imagine you only had the Y combinator and arithmetic and a few other things. Well, you can still solve these problems, but the programs are really long, hard to find, hard to understand. So if you give these problems to the algorithm, this is what it does at first during its waking phase. And then during the sleep phase, what it does is it constructs these data structures that encode a large set of refactorings um, and then explores this space to find refactorings that best compress those programs. So in particular, it explores a space of around 10 to the 14th power refactorings. And I've shown here uh, just one of each of those refactorings. And I've highlighted in orange a sub-expression that those two refactorings have in common. Now, if you add that orange sub-expression to your um, library, then all of a sudden, these programs become much shorter and much easier for a human to understand. They're much more interpretable. Um, and crucially, if we now have map in our library, that can bootstrap the learning of uh, other problems. So 10 to the 14 is a terrifyingly large number and would take centuries to explicitly enumerate and search. But we can do this using a data structure with around 10 to the six nodes and takes around five minutes in this case to uh, do this calculation. So now I'm going to show um, some experimental results with this algorithm on a few different domains. So we've applied this thing, this algorithm to uh, problems like flash flow style text editing um, and sort of programming type problems. Uh, but I want to zoom in on some problems uh, for uh, drawing images, planning to build things, uh, recursive programming, and equation discovery. So for this drawing images task, what we did is we gave the system a corpus of 160 local graphics images. So they're geometric patterns like the ones shown here. And we equipped it with a sort of standard logo graphics programming language. So it had um, for loops and arithmetic and um, had a stack so we could like save its state, things like that. But it didn't know about um, concepts like circles or polygons or symmetries. So if you run this algorithm on th this corpus of tasks, this is uh, what happens. So there's an action packed figure. So I'm going to sort of break it, break it apart slowly in pieces. Um, on the left, you can see the inventory of primitives initially given to the system. In the middle, I'm showing the functions learned by the system diagrammed as a network. And on the right, I'm showing four example tasks and beneath each of them, the code it wrote to solve that task. So if you look at this task here, the kind of swirly beach ball task, um, you can see that I wrote some code which calls out to function eight and function four, where function eight and function four are things that the system uh, discovered through refactoring. So function four is a parametric drawing routine for producing spiral-like uh, figures. And function eight is a routine for repeatedly drawing and rotating the same segment. So this makes sense because this swirly beach ball is really a spiral that's been spun around a bunch of times. Now function eight is really a higher order function uh, and it corresponds to the concept of radial symmetry and it can produce images like those shown here. So if you look at this uh, library of learned primitives, you see other parametric drawing routines. Some of them are highly interpretable and correspond to words we have in English, like a routine for drawing circles. Others are less interpretable, but nonetheless useful for drawing a wide range of figures, such as this parametric arc drawing routine. So these learned functions correspond to the system's declarative knowledge. It's uh, explicit uh, human understandable stuff that uh, it added to its programming language, but it's also training a neural network, the recognition model, which is a kind of implicit statistical knowledge. That neural network is trained on uh, samples from the library, or, which in wake sleep algorithms are called dreams. And it's instructive to look at what those dreams actually are. So here I'm showing um, dreams that the system produces prior to learning. So it's color coded not just to make it look dreamier, but to illustrate how it actually drew these things. 
So it started out drawing in dark purple and ended drawing in light pink. Uh, the vast majority of these dreams are just simple line segments. Um, the dreams you're seeing here are cherry picked from 150 samples because almost all of them are either a blank canvas or a single line. But the thing is that you don't want to train your neural network on data like this. This is not good training data for a neural network. So now we should look at the dreams after learning. So after learning, what you see is a kind of uh, remixing of the original training data. So it's acquired these abstractions from the programs that it found in the training data. And then it composes them in new ways that sometimes look a little bit crazy, but would be um, uh, ideal for training a broadly generalizable recognition model. It's a similar idea to domain randomization. Um, now, for fair comparison, these are also the most interesting dreams from 150 samples. Um, but I've shown you these to highlight the ways in which these um, hallucinated programs generalize strongly beyond the training data. Like these are uh, generally much more complex than the images that were in the original training data. So in addition to uh, learning to draw pictures, we can also give it a kind of planning uh, set of tasks. So here we give it control over a simulated hand instead of control over a simulated pen. And it drops blocks onto a world and is tasked with building a range of uh, tower-like objects. If you look at its learn library, what you see are things that look like uh, parametric options. They're like higher level macro operators that it can use to plan how to build things. And they're usually pretty human understandable. So things like walls and arches and pyramids. We can look at the dreams before learning, and we can also see the dreams after learning. And again, some of these look a little bit um, crazy, but they're still much better training data than the dreams before learning. It's also instructive to look at the system's learning trajectory over wake sleep cycles. So initially, um, almost no problems are solvable. So here on the x-axis, I'm plotting wake sleep cycles, and on the y-axis, how many held out test problems it can solve. But after a few wake sleep cycles, it sort of bootstraps itself, and this snowballing action causes it to solve most of the tasks. Um, you might ask, do we really need both these sleep phases? And it turns out that if you ablate either of these sleep phases, you get much lower asymptotic performance. We can also compare with a range of baselines. So one baseline that's really critical is just what would happen if you did an enormous amount of brute force search without any learning. So we tried doing 24 hours of brute force search, 24 hours per problem, and even then it fails to get off the ground. We also compared with a um, sort of state-of-the-art neural program synthesis method, Robustville, and also to further isolate the role of this refactoring algorithm, we tried running our algorithm exactly the same, except instead of refactoring the programs, it just memorizes them wholesale. And that's shown in purple. And as you can see, uh, you actually really need this refactoring. Like it's not just memorizing stuff in the training data, it needs to learn abstractions from the training data. And if you look across many different domains, you get the same kind of global picture, that you really do need both these sleep phases and that learning unfolds typically over between five and 15 wake sleep cycles. So I think that there's a kind of synergy between these two wake sleep cycles, and it, it's fairly intuitive, um, and it works as follows. So we have three things going on. We have problem solving during waking, library learning during abstraction sleep, and this neural network, the recognition model, that's trained during dream sleep. Here's how this synergy operates. As we solve more problems, we get more data from which we can learn our library. Our, our library. And as our library grows, as you saw earlier, the dreams become more interesting. Random programs become richer and more representative of the kinds of problems you want to solve. But as we solve, as we get a better recognition model, we can then solve more problems during waking. And that creates a kind of positive feedback cycle where when one part of the system improves, it kind of echoes and reverberates to the rest of the system. And there's other feedback cycles here, but I wanted to focus on this synergy between these two different sleep phases. So this story is intuitive and consistent with the data I showed you earlier, but I, I think that is actually what is going on. And there's some empirical data to support this view. So that empirical data comes from examining the evolution of the library structure 
over the course of training. So here I'm showing that evolution. On the x-axis, I'm plotting a statistic of the library structure, in particular the average depth of the library components when viewed as a network. And on the y-axis, I'm showing how many problems are solved. Um, in darker shade, I'm showing earlier on in training, and in brighter shades, uh, later in training. So what you can see is that the library evolves to be deeper, and that deeper libraries are correlated with solving more tasks. Now, if you ablate the dream phase of sleep, if you get rid of the recognition model, there are two things that happen. One is that your libraries become shallower. So if you look at this plot, you can see that the red points are um, farther to the left on the x-axis. And we know that library depth is positively correlated with solving more problems. But even then, for a given depth, you still don't solve as many problems when you don't have a neural recognition model. So there's two factors at play here. One is that the neural recognition model bootstraps better libraries. The other is that for a given library structure, the neural network still helps. And analogous but weaker trends hold if you look at the total library size instead of the average library depth. So in each of these examples, um, we gave the system a kind of like kind of like a sketch of an initial DSL. Like we outlined the core essential primitives, like the basic control flow operators and the data types. Um, and then we asked it to enrich that language with abstractions that it got from the training data. But in theory, you could push this farther. In particular, you could do something which looks more like learning a full language. So I'm gonna look at two examples of something in this direction. The two case studies are learning a language for vector algebra and physics, starting from a functional programming language. And then I'm gonna look at how we can start with a very ancestral form of Lisp and then recover something that looks like a modern functional language. So for physics, what we did is we took um, AP physics cheat sheets and MCAT cheat sheets. You might remember these from high school. And then we simulated data from 60 different equations from these cheat sheets. And then we asked the system to come up with programs that fit that simulated data. The twist here though, is that we didn't tell it about vectors. Instead, we represented vectors as lists of numbers and gave it functions for manipulating lists such as map and fold. So this is what that setup looks like. On the left, you can see the primitives given to the initial system, things like map and fold and arithmetic. And on the right, you can see um, six of these 60 equations. So if you look into its learned library in the first layer, what you see are things that look like vector algebra. So it learns routines for like scaling vectors, subtracting vectors, things like that. And as you go deeper into its library, what you see are things that look a little bit more like physics. So you see a routine, for example, for integrating second derivatives over time. And if you go to the deepest layer, what you see are things like schemas for inverse square laws. And once you have this library, you can solve um, most of the problems in, on these physics cheat sheets. Now, I, I wanna examine the solution it found to Coulomb's law. And if you look at it, it says, um, call your inverse square law schema and pass it the displacement vector that you get by subtracting uh, the two uh, particles positions. Now, I think that this description is very close to how a physicist would reason about uh, Coulomb's law and how they would represent it formally. But if you were to imagine rewriting it in terms of the initial primitives, it's just incomprehensible. And on the surface, does not obviously have anything to do with Coulomb's law. So by learning this library, um, these problems became both more tractable and also the solutions became more human understandable. So now I'm going to look at those functional programming primitives and ask from what basis could those be learned? So to answer that question, what we did is we created a problem set of 20 functional programming exercises and initialized the system with uh, a very Spartan basis with just things like conditionals and the Y Combinator and list data types. Um, now, if you look at the learned library, what you see in the first layer are these two functions. Uh, one of them is called fold, um, and one of them is called unfold. Uh, fold, also known as reduce, is pretty popular, but unfold is a little bit uh, more esoteric. It's kind of like 
the dual form of fold. It recursively produces lists instead of recursively consuming lists. And in a really precise sense, these are the two most elemental operations over recursive data. Once you have fold and unfold, you can uh, express any recursive function over uh, recursive data. Um, and once it had defined fold and unfold in terms of the Y Combinator, the system then proceeded to never use the Y Combinator. So it defined functions in the fold family, such as map and filter, uh, some functions in the unfold family. So for example, uh, range, if you know that from Python is an unfold. Uh, these other functions in the unfold family are sort of non-standard unfolds that it decided would be useful, uh, but they tend to, they're ones which are human understandable enough that one can give them an English description. As there's also other functions that bring together the fold and unfold family. So this style of programming where instead of using the Y combinator, you use fold and unfold um, is a, I think a really cool idea. Um, it's sometimes called origami programming. And um, it's a nice idea, and it's one which I don't think uh, John McCarthy, creator of Lisp, or uh, Alonzo Church, inventor of Lambda Calculus, um, were uh, thinking of at the time. Um, the nicest exposition of this idea is this work by Jeremy Gibbons, although it's actually, this idea of origami programming is actually a bit older. Um, and while it's cool that it sort of retraced this origami style, what I, what I think you should take from this is a kind of broader point which is that you're not stuck with the symbols that you start with. So here it started out with the Y Combinator, and then it immediately did a kind of change of basis and proceeded to never use the Y Combinator and instead use these other two um, recursive functions that are defined in terms of it. Now, one, of, one catch here is that because it was starting from so little, this took a lot of compute in order to uh, bootstrap itself. In particular, this took approximately one year of compute time. Um, but I didn't actually have to wait an entire year because this algorithm can be run on many different CPUs. Um, and the fact that it can soak up these compute resources um, I, makes me think that it might be able to scale um, in much the same way that many other machine learning methods are scaling. So there's a few things you should take away from this. One is that symbols aren't necessarily interpretable. Um, like symbols is not synonymous with interpretability or explainability. But if we want explainable, interpretable, symbolic AI, one way of doing that is to flexibly grow your symbolic language. And doing so makes it both more human understandable and better for problem solving. The second thing to take away from this is that maybe you could learn from scratch. Maybe you could just start with like a Turing machine or Lambda calculus, but I don't think you have to do that. The cool thing about um, program induction is that it lets you build in what you know how to build in and then learn the rest on top of that. So now I'm going to take, take stock and look forward. And I want to recap by saying that what you should think of this is as a kind of toolkit for doing program induction. And it works by addressing this core problem of combinatorial search. And the way we address this is by combining ideas from machine learning, but also ideas from programming languages. There's many different directions that remain open. So I'm highlighting just a few of them here. Um, the, we, we've been looking at how we can combine library learning with semantic parsing, both so that you can learn a better language for your semantic parser, but also so that you can make the semantic parsing problem more tractable by having the right abstractions um, when you're doing the search over uh, logical forms. Um, I've talked a little bit about how we can use program synthesis to do uh, model discovery at both levels of science, both at the level of models for individual, individual data sets, but also at the kind of meta level. But I think more broadly that we can apply these ideas to the many kinds of computer-aided science efforts that are already going on. Most of this talk has really been about what program induction can do for AI, but many of these methods uh, for learning to synthesize programs are equally applicable to program synthesis. And I'm hopeful that these methods for learning to synthesize programs can help move program synthesis even more out of the lab and into the real world. Program induction actually didn't start on a computer screen, but really on a sheet of paper. It actually started um, in the 60s with some theorems that were proved after the uh, Dartmouth workshop. And I think that um, it would be really good to revisit those basic theoretical issues especially since the early theoretical work 
considered the case of a single synthesis problem in isolation, whereas these learning-based methods work much better when you're jointly solving many interrelated problems. So I think we need to revisit that both to understand why these algorithms work, where they're not going to work, and also to suggest ways that they can be improved. I've talked a little bit about uh, inducing programs for 3D objects, but I think that we can push this towards something much richer that looks more like modeling the physical world. So I'm going to zoom in very briefly on this last future direction. Uh, so if we look at the physical world, we see many different uh, reused concepts like hinges and gears and doorknobs and pulleys. And the goal would be to learn how to model that full range of uh, physical objects. So you might imagine building in something like a CAD engine, which has programming primitives like for loops, but also physics like rigid body dynamics. And then if you wanted to explain something really complicated, like this gear box contraption toy thing on the right, you can imagine growing out a library of reusable CAD primitives. And you, know, you could build something like a gear primitive, which can then be used to construct a gear train primitive, which together with a many other elements of a learned library could explain a complicated object like this. But the world also has towers of Hanoi toys and swivel chairs, and this is going to be a very hard long-term project, and it's going to require collaborations from people in programming languages and graphics and machine learning and robotics and many other areas. So all of these things, I think, are within reach in the near future. Um, but now I want to step back and talk more broadly about um, where we want to go. So wh what, what, what do I think could be in the future of machine learning? So there's a number of things that I think we want in the future of machine learning. One is that we want strong generalization, even on the basis of small amounts of experience. But at the same time, we want systems that from larger amounts of experience can kind of bootstrap themselves or learn to learn, and where that learning to learn is enabled by representation learning. One way of seeing this library learning system is that it's a kind of representation learning, but where the hierarchical representation is built out of symbolic code. But most broadly, I think what we want our systems that uh, don't just make predictions, but which discover something that looks like knowledge that humans can understand and build on. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that program induction is going to get us all of these things. We need lots of good ideas from many different areas if we want all of these things in the future of machine learning. But I hope to have convinced you that program induction can be a core part of the story here and that the steps we're taking are headed in this direction. So that's it. And I'd like to thank all of my collaborators because I'm really grateful to have worked with all of these smart and kind and interesting people. And I want to thank all of you for coming out and uh, seeing this talk virtually over Zoom. So that's it. And I'll take questions. Um, thank you um, so much. It's a great talk. Um, we're running a little bit late, but I think we do have time for a question or two for people who can hang on. Um, looks like Zach um, has got his hand up. Yeah, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I love this combination of, of techniques. Uh, one quick question. Uh, so when you're learning programs, especially higher order functional programs, one thing that's tricky is that the meaning of a variable suddenly depends on its context. Yeah, uh, and I was wondering how that plays out uh, in these techniques. Like when I have these binders, you know, the same sub-expression can mean totally different things in different contexts. So where does that, uh, how does that work out? Right, so th there's two places where that really comes into play. One is when you're defining um, generative models over programs, you need to make sure that you obey scoping rules and uh, typing rules. So you have to take care to keep track of the variables in scope and what their types are. The second place where this comes in is when you're doing the refactoring. You have to make sure that you, um, you know, uh, it's not really clear what two expressions with free variables, uh, what, what it means for them to be semantically equivalent. So what we did there is we used a Boolean indices to represent free variables. And we said that two expressions are semantically equivalent if they're exactly the same under all substitutions of those variables. Um, so you, you do have to uh, take care to make sure that like the algorithm is like sound and complete um, with respect to uh, those factors. 
Um, great, thanks. I think uh, Jennifer's got the next question. Um, so at the beginning of the talk, you had the example of the binary search tree uh, drawing where the um, there was like an error in uh, the way that the binary search tree was, was like learned. Um, and then you said that, you know, if we have this inductive bias towards simple programs, we can learn the correct tree. Um, and so I was wondering, like, uh, presumably sometimes that inductive bias is not is not enough to get you all the way back to like your correct interpretation. So I was wondering like, uh, let's imagine you were in this drawing example and the program like uh, extrapolated in a way that you didn't expect or that you thought was wrong. Uh, what techniques or methods are there to like correct the program? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's a case where you need um, some kind of uh, good user interface. Um, so for hand drawings in particular, uh, there was this work called Sketch and Sketch on having sort of bi-directional transfer between a program representing a drawing and the image of the drawing. So that, you know, if the uh, drawing does the wrong thing, you can edit it and it'll propagate back to the program or you can change the program and it will update the drawing. But I think that, you know, if you wanna make a practical system that uh, is useful for people when they're like uh, diagramming their neural net architectures or graphical models and like converting into LaTeX, uh, you need something like that, like some kind of smart user interface. Um, right now, the system we built doesn't have the interface. So, you know, if it makes a mistake, then it just makes a mistake and you have to edit the code. Um, but uh, like the, I, I think that the right answer to that is like, you, you need to actually have some HCI there and like think about a smart way of uh, exposing the connection between the image and the program to the user. Uh, next question to Remy. Yeah, so from uh, all of your work, uh, it seems that you build up your complex programs from very simple building blocks, uh, and including your library function, you also build those from your uh, basic building blocks. So have you considered trying to leverage uh, human written uh, libraries and functions, maybe either to use them as your uh, library blocks or try to learn your bias, uh, induction bias from human written code? <coughs> Yes, yes, um, absolutely. Um, so some low hanging fruit here, I think, is to crawl the web for files called utilities.py and try importing all of those functions as like your library. Um, but uh, uh, more broadly, uh, w one issue is that um, a, a lot of code that you would find on like GitHub is kind of not written um, to be used by synthesizers, it's to, written to be used by humans. And the kind of library code that is useful for synthesizers might be very different. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at like the domain specific language for Flashfill, um, it, it looks kind of like a standard string processing library, but it's very streamlined and uh, chooses very carefully what to include. Um, so I, I think that you could get some mileage out of um, like mining the web for um, things like utilities.py. Um, but you, you need to be like very careful and you would probably need some way of uh, assessing whether or not they're actually useful for synthesis tasks. Um, but it could be a really good uh, way of uh, like bootstrapping a library. Uh, next question from James. Yeah, hi. Um, it's really cool that your, your method can find these modular pieces that basically encode domain knowledge and whatever task you give it. But so how, I was wondering how, uh, how practical or how in practice, how easy is it to find and interpret the library functions corresponding to various pieces of knowledge, like the physical laws and integration rules and functional programming primitives? Yeah, so I, I would that, say yeah. roughly around 75% of them are like human interpretable and easily understandable. Um, the, the remaining like 25% of them are places where the system has found some kind of uh, uh, like a coincidence across the training examples. Um, I think one way of making the learned libraries more interpretable is to augment the system with some natural language side information. So if each task had some natural language describing what it should be doing, um, then you could use that natural language to cue the learning of different library functions. And you could try and learn a library such that the functions you're learning are um, isomorphic to uh, parts of natural language. Um, so like, 
um, like as humans, we have uh, not just examples that help us learn reusable concepts, but also uh, natural language. I think that plays a really key role and it's missing from a uh, system I described here, but we're looking into ways of incorporating it. Um, uh, and a question for me. Um, so, so thanks again. I think it was really interesting um, and inspiring uh, about dream coders, your applications to so many different domains. And I'm trying to understand exactly what you had to change between the different domains. Obviously yeah, yeah. you gave different primitives um, in, in each case. And I'm not sure how sensitive the performance of the system was to the exact choice of those primitives, but then you also had to give it uh, you know, some data or challenge problems. Can you say exactly what you changed between uh, the different settings and give us a sense about the range of hyperparameters involved? Yeah, yeah, uh, so that's a really good question. Um, so the, um, the, the main thing that it's sensitive to is whether or not there's a sort of graded spectrum of difficulty. So if you only give it really hard problems, and it's going to need a huge amount of compute in order to solve those problems. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off between compute and data here. Um, like if you give it easy problems, it needs less compute. If you give it hard problems, or if you give it problems that are hard relative to its initial uh, library of functions, then you need more compute. So in the origami programming example, um, it needed ridiculous amounts of compute because it was starting with like the Y Combinator. Um, Whereas for the programming exercises that I was showing earlier, like sorting lists of functions, it started out with map and fold. And so it needed uh, far less compute, uh, like orders of magnitude less. Um, in terms of sensitivity to the initial primitives, um, so we, we've done, so you definitely can, like, uh, like in the limit of adding a large number of uh, irrelevant primitives, you can uh, make it sort of arbitrarily difficult for the system. Um, and in order to get around that, you would have to compensate by adding more compute, um, but eventually would learn to downweight the use of those primitives. Um, I think the, the main variable it's sensitive to is really that, um, uh, the kind of curriculum. So we didn't really train it in a curriculum fashion. Uh, we trained it on like random mini batches of tasks. So the error bars I was showing you earlier were over the random seed for that mini batching. Um, so it's not really sensitive to the order in which it sees the task, but it's pretty sensitive to whether there's some easy tasks in the corpus. Gotcha. I think, thanks so much. Um, well, I think we are o over time at this point, um, but uh, thank you again for a fantastic talk and maybe people can unmute and um, give our speaker um, a last uh, note of appreciation.